Hello, everyone, and welcome to the We Heart America show with Don and Ella. Each week, we take you on a compelling and thrilling journey featuring American legends, unsung heroes, and honored esteemed celebrities. I, along with my fellow co host, best selling author Donald Jeffries, who happens to have the day off, we showcase incredible stories from extraordinary people, and you can get the inside scoop from the most intriguing people on the planet. And who do I have today? I have a guest that embodies the word integrity, and his name is Eric, and he's an attorney and a veteran of the U.S. Navy who holds a deep desire for real unity and change. It seems to be in Eric's DNA. His late grandfather, the eccentric soap maker, Dr. Emanuel Bronner, dedicated his life to uniting spaceship and earth. And like his grandfather, Eric believes the best way to restore more unity in our communities and put United back into the United States is through cost cross-partisan democracy reforms. Eric says there's a need to restore and rebuild a more ethical and effective government of, by, and for the people because, as Dr. Bronner said, we are all one or none. He is the board chairperson of Show Me Integrity, which is exactly the goal of his organization, which we'll be discussing further. He is the board chair and founder of Veterans for Political Innovations and a leader with Missouri's premier cross-partisan democracy reform organization. He is actively building a new nationwide veteran service organization focused on advocating on their behalf. So I just want to say welcome to the show, Eric. It's such an honor. Thank you very much, Ella. Thank you for having me. Okay, so I don't know where to start, but because your grandfather is so legendary and he obviously had impact on you, maybe we can start with him just briefly. Sure. He, he was a very inspiring figure. One of my grandpa's many passions was practicing constructive capitalism. And he built uh, Dr. Brunner's magic soap from, from literally the basement of a condemned tenement hotel in Los Angeles in 1948 into the world's top selling natural soap. And uh, one of the most ethical and just well-run companies that you'll find anywhere on the planet. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, and his story really moved me. Um, from what I understand, um, he um, he was a Jewish. Uh, he studied the Jewish religion, and right. from what I read, his his parents were murdered in the Holocaust. Would you like to talk about that also? They were, and, and that of course had a tremendous impact on him. Um, the last letter that he ever received from his father. It, it was simply a postcard um, that said you were right, and it was from Auschwitz, which was a, the concentration camp where his father was killed. And um, so that and the, the loss of his young wife and a number of other traumatic events happening in short succession led him to this sort of vision quest of, you know, what is my purpose and mission in life? And he really felt like it uh, he came to the conclusion it was to to be a uniter, to try to bring people together across divisions, especially religious divisions. That was that was his passion. OK, and now we can talk about your important work. So your your organization was established and um, on your website, it says we're a cross partisan movement for more effective ethical government of and by and for the people. And so how how did this organization come about? Who were the players? Yeah, it's it's really uh, an exciting grassroots movement. So Show Me Integrity was founded uh, about two years ago by four incredibly diverse people in, in every sense of the word. So one of our founding members is the president of the Missouri NAACP. His name's Rod Chappell. Another one of our founding members is the son of a Tea Party state senator named Rob Schaff. And so we are truly cross-partisan. We have people from all over the political spectrum who are united by one common cause. And, and that's the fact that our system is broken. It's corrupt, too, too often corrupt and dysfunctional. And we need to come together to figure out ways to reform the system to make it work better for everyone. Mm -hmm. And how did you become involved with with a specific interest in assisting veterans. Right. So my connection there, so I, I went to the Naval Academy um, and on a reunion weekend not too long ago, it was uh, the Labor Day weekend of, of 2018, 
I was with some of my closest Navy buddies and uh, the late Senator John McCain, who's a personal hero of mine, passed away. We watched his memorial service together. Uh, we watched the great documentary For Whom the Bell Tolls. And all of my friends and I, we just had this deep sense of, you know, we really need to do something more for our country to honor Senator McCain's legacy. Because, you know, whatever you think of his politics, I, I don't think anyone would deny that he really was the type of person who demonstrated moral courage and political courage to step across the aisle to try to get things done. And we wanted to try to carry on that spirit. We didn't really know exactly what that meant. Uh, but for me personally, that led me on a journey of figuring out uh, what, what is my mission and, and how can I engage wisely in the political arena when I'm not a red team guy and I'm not a blue team guy, I'm an independent. And so eventually that led me to finding Show Me Integrity here, me, here in Missouri. And now my passion is to connect more veterans with this fast-growing political reform movement. Mm -hmm. And we all know that veterans need uh, more assistance. I mean, historically, they have not been getting the help they need, and so many are traumatized and wounded and are just trying to uh, come back to the United States and to be able to function again as a, as a productive person in society and trying to heal from the damages that are done while in war. And people just don't understand the impact war has on an individual. Some do, some don't. Right. Right. No, and I, and I was very fortunate that um, for the most part, I, I was serving during in between the two Gulf Wars. Um, I was on active duty during 9-11 and I was on, on board the aircraft carrier, the George Washington, off the court coast of New York City the day after 9-11. But I, I didn't experience near anything close to, you know, some of the trauma that some of my, my friends uh, who served on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan, they were, you're right, there, there are uh, wounds and scars from, from war that can take a very long time to heal. Mm -hmm. and, and how did you become interested in politics? I was one of those strange kids who caught the political bug at, at a very young age. I watched political conventions from beginning to end. And then that manifested, you know, in running for any kind of office I could, whether that was student government or at Boys State or becoming the, the vice president of my class at the Naval Academy. And um, I, I did an internship in the U.S. Senate and um, thought that I would run for office a long time ago, honestly. Um, I'm, I'm 45 years old now. And but like I said, because I'm not a red team or a blue team person, that really limits your option in our current system, which is a classic duopoly, right? Where, you know, two private parties pretty much write all the rules and control who gets to play or who doesn't. Mm -hmm. And the state of our country is really sad right now. I've never, I, I, I've never seen it so divided, of course, I'm fairly on the young side. And to see what has occurred uh, as of late, it's just, it, it, weighs heavily on so many American citizens, and I don't know how we're going to heal. Um, do you, what's your opinion on how we got, how it ended up like this? How did this tension uh, start to rise and manifest in our country? Yeah, you know, there's so many factors. It, it, it is complicated. I've, I've read some fascinating books recently. One I'm reading right now is just called Why We're Polarized by Ezra Klein. Another book I just finished by David French is called Divided We Fall. And, and some of the common themes would be there really has been some, something relatively new or in modern political history would be some, some refer to it as identity politics, right? Where if you are a part of this group, then you are expected to vote one way. And there's so much pressure put on people <laughs> you know, who I, depending on how you identify that you don't even want to admit if, if, if you didn't follow the group think as far as who you were supposed to vote for, a lot of people don't even feel like they can talk about that, right? So there's a little bit of this herd mentality or polarization, but I feel like for me, the, the bottom, uh, the root source would be a two-party system that really incentivizes extreme polarization through a partisan primary process where 
we reward the most extreme candidates in most states, you know, with closed partisan primaries, uh, the most extreme candidate is going to have the advantage. And over time, our Congress has gotten gotten more and more extreme from my perspective. And you have fewer and fewer moderates or people in the, in the center of the spectrum. Mm-hmm. And, and I've read that there's no advanced industrial democracy in the world more politically divided or politically dysfunctional. Um, as right. we have in the United States today. And, um, you know, and then, of course, the events of January 6th. And that's really where I saw the tensions collide, uh, the, the, uh, the partisan parties at war, basically. And, right. um, you know, that, again, was very difficult. And I also think there's the enduring legacy of race and the changing nature of capitalism and the fracturing of our collective media landscape as well. Um, sure. And so race also has played into it. And I'm one of those naive people that believed when President Obama took office that racism must be just just a, a small fraction or, or a small part of the America, the Americans uh, belief system. I just didn't realize it was right. still there. Right. Right. I think many, many people were hopeful, right, that there was going to be this post partisan or post-racial era that we entered into, but we obviously, we have a lot of work to do and a long way to go as a, uh, as a country to realize Martin Luther King Jr.'s vision. Um, and yeah, that's going to be incumbent upon all of us to continue learning and, and what, what is my role in, you know, actively combating racism in the community where I live and teaching my kids to, you know, to, uh, to value everyone regardless of race or or where they come from. Mm -hmm. You know, that was easy for me. My family came from Sweden and they're very embracing of all cultures and all people. And so I was never, I never knew that. I mean, my, my parents, my mom had many black friends and they'd have parties and I thought they were wonderful. And I had a black nanny for a while and she was funny and she was wonderful. So I didn't know that. And then we moved to Texas. We'd been in California. And then I heard the N-word and I kept hearing it all the time. I'm like, what are these kids saying? And say, you know, other things like, oh, beaners and wetbacks and uh, right. you know, enchilada eaters. And then I heard the N-word and I came home and I just had a conversation with my mother and father that night. They always asked me about my day. And I said, you know, mom, dad, I keep hearing the N-word. And I said the word and they're like, oh, you know, that's something we're seeing that we didn't know was really a problem. We just, you know, we came to America. It was like, uh, you know, it was during, you know, the 50s and the 60s. And we saw a big change from the 50s to the 60s and the 70s. And it's just a surprising. But there's, you know, here in this particular state we're living in, it seems very common. It's not to say that's how it is nowadays, but, um, you know, it made them both so sad. They both told me how very, very sad and disturbing that was. And, um, yeah, sure. it was just really hard for me to understand that. Uh, but then we went back to the coast and you don't really experience that a lot. I mean, there's still, you know, there was like, oh, you don't want to go to that part of um, of town because you'll get shot because you're a white person. Um, so right. there's all this fear. People people try to invoke fear in, in you um, around certain uh, cultures and peoples. And, um, you right. know. You know, and I was a staunch Republican until I moved to California and somehow, you know, and then I became much more liberal because I, people took the time to really explain to me things that maybe I wasn't aware of or, or explain things in a context in which I could understand the bigger picture. And, right. uh, you know, and now we're up in right. Oregon, it's kind of mixed, you know, it's a mixed place, but the coast seemed to be, uh, you know, and I lived in New York City, went to school in New York City. So, uh, again, I just was I'm so shocked and appalled. Sometimes sometimes I have a hard time sleeping because my heart is just so heavy from what right. I've seen as of, late, as of late. Yeah, no, it, it can be really, really disheartening. And, and certainly the events of, of January 6th were you know, extremely tragic. I think for many of us in the political reform movement, we we were not completely surprised by what happened. Um, but it's it's still very sad, and it's part of what motivates me is I I don't want something like that to ever ever happen again in my lifetime, and I don't think the solution is there's no silver bullet there's no simple solution but 
for me and uh, for and for many of us in the reform world, it, it's fixing the system. Um, let's let's stop making the other party or someone who thinks differently than I do. Let's stop making them the enemy. And can we agree that we have a broken system that both parties take advantage of because the political industrial complex is a self-serving, self-aggrandizing uh, complex, and they try to keep competition out at all costs. So politics is literally the only industry where, for whatever reason, we don't think that more competition is a good idea. And then we have the evolving nature of capitalism. That's something that we've been witnessing, especially ever since the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Of course, we've seen like a collapse in, in our uh, economy and right. and with the ability of families to take care of their family and run businesses. So you add that on top of everything and it's really just a cluster mess. Um, so what do you think, what do you think about that? What's your, what's your point of view in regards to the changing landscape of capitalism? Well, I mean, again, it, it, it's so, so complex that I don't feel uh, completely qualified to speak to it other than I'll go back to my, my grandpa's experience, which was practicing constructive capitalism, right? I'm, my family, we are a hundred percent in support of capitalism if it's constructive um, but but far too often, we have la large multinational corporations that are taking advantage of every tax break and tax loophole they can, not, not to give right. back, mm -hmm. not to give back to the environment or their workers, but to just to make more profit and and pay more to their shareholders. And so there has to be um, some type of new constructive capitalism. But I, that's not going to just happen on its own, right? Because we, unfortunately, we as humans tend to be pretty pretty selfish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to be the world's uh, preeminent superpower. And right. it's so sad that uh, that's not really how other countries are viewing us. And, you know, we have such an entrepreneurial spirit, as your grandfather will, uh, is a great example of. And that's kind of, you know, and then we're also one of the most innovative countries, if not the most innovative right. country. Right. Yeah. So, so picking up on that theme, we are trying to channel America's great history of innovation into a new movement for political innovation, right? Um, there was the progressive era back a hundred years ago, and I, I'm originally from Wisconsin, so uh, fighting Bob La Follette was one of the progressive leaders. He was a governor of Wisconsin, and that led to uh, women's suffrage. It led to the opening up of primaries were no longer completely controlled by parties. They let, they let voters vote in the primaries for the first time. Those were much needed white reforms. Women. Yeah, like white women, you know, black women. It was a, took a little longer. Sure. sure. Yes. Good. Good, good, point. good point. So, and, so, and now we are here. We are a hundred years later, and we really need another movement for innovation and for reform at large, systematic reforms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just hope that when this is all, I don't know if this COVID nineteen is ever really going to be over. Um, it, I think. It's the way that we live is now forever changed, I believe. Um, right. which, what's your take on COVID-19? What do you think? You know, I know that you're, uh, you know, bipartisan or nonpartisan person. Um, how do you think the former uh, cabinet dealt with the COVID-19 versus Biden's uh, approach? Well, I mean, we had a lot of missed opportunities. Um, under the former administration, from my perspective, again, this is this is uh, one of the symptoms of a broken system, though, right? Where everything gets politicized. There's no reason why wearing a mask or not wearing a mask should be politicized, or that you should judge me. You know, people will say, "Well, I, I know what way I can tell how you vote just based on whether you wear a, a mask or not," and th that's just such a sad state of an of affairs. We, we really missed an opportunity to have a united response against a pandemic, a, a threat that we had never seen before. Well, not for almost 100 years as a, as a country. And um, instead, we had a very divisive, divided political response. And it was really, really unfortunate. Yeah, just unfortunate. And, you know, even on January 6th, that came up uh, 
is an issue because, of course, many of Trump's supporters, for whatever reason, I don't, you know, Trump had coronavirus himself, uh, refused to wear a mask. And so when they were all uh, secluded into a tight knit quarter, um, you know, other senators, um, even though they had a mask on, they contracted uh, COVID-19 as well. Right. Yes, yeah, right. the CDC thing. They weren't six feet apart. That's that's a given. Sure. And yeah, I kind of encourage people to to wear a mask because you just, people are like, oh, it's very dangerous. And I'm like, what about those surgeons who spend 12 hours in surgery? Why do you think they wear those masks? Because you're, oh, masks don't work. Well, apparently they do. Is you know that's why the medical um, the the medical um, you know is, industry uh, they use masks to prevent the spread of germs. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I'm a person of faith. So I just see, you know, wearing a mask as a way to love, love my neighbors. Right. Um, my, my wife has an autoimmune disease. And uh, so she's a little more at risk. And for anyone else whose wife or parents or uh, grandparents are at risk, I mean, wearing a mask is just a way to, to help take good care of our neighbors, I, I think. But again, it got it. This became politicized and be, has become a political football and just for really for our politicians to score cheap points um, on whatever side of the aisle, you just have far too many um, career politicians who are, they are no longer serving the public's best interest. Uh, too often they are serving private interests, uh, lobbyists, special interests, you know, that, that have, that are pulling the strings, the levers behind the scenes. And that's, those are the kinds of influences that we need to fight against with really common sense, smart reforms. Mm -hmm. I agree. Well, we have a few more minutes before the break. I think we have a little bit of time to get into this as well. And then there's the issue with social media and right. versus mainstream news. And right. that, of course, you know, uh, from the very beginning, Trump called uh, mainstream news fake news. And yes, I do right. believe they are kind of uh it's narrow what they're allowed to discuss as far as opinions go they're there to deliver the news that they are given um but some do allow uh, a commentary stance and so now people more than ever can't even trust the media uh, or don't trust the media i should say and so there's like this um convoluted view uh, of being able to discern discern the facts you know, people on right. social media, you know, QAnon, I'm sure you're familiar with that, uh, sure. created uh, disinformation and misinformation in many regards, not all regards, but in many regards. And um, I think that that made it very difficult to to filter the truth from misinformation or disinformation. Sure. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so that's the new reality we're, we're living in. I heard someone say you know, we're having an eighth grade moment as a country when it comes to social media and news. We, we are still so young into this new digital era that we're still trying to learn and figure things out. And someone else said, you know, our, our kids, when they're older and they're looking back, they're, they're going to say, I can't believe, I can't believe so many people were that gullible. Um, but we just haven't learned how to deal with all these multiple disparate sources of in information coming at us all the time, every day from, you know, so many different angles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And of course there's propaganda and that's something that, and I hate bringing this up because, you know, this is a conservative station for the most part, um, but most conservatives, you know, I'm talking about the extreme right here, the extreme, uh, which I didn't even know. It's interesting that we have an extreme right now, um, but we do. And right. it's, it's just being fed all this information from a propaganda from a propaganda machine, really, if you will. And I mean, I could go into that for quite some time. I don't know what your take is on QAnon, um, what you think about it, and where it might have come from. Um, would you want to start with that, or do you know another <laughs> lot about QAnon? Do you have opinions on that? Well, I mean, I think QAnon in general is incredibly dangerous. I, I really have no idea what the source was, or where you know where. It came from but the fact that we have now people sitting in congress who believe that you know for instance 9-11 was an inside job or that some of these mass school shootings never happened that's that's incredibly dangerous and 
I, again, I, my, my hope in, in some of the reform work that I'm doing is I, I don't think that moderates and centrists are the answer to all of our country's problems, but we have polarized to extremes on both sides of the political spectrum, and that, that is pulling us apart. And, and now both sides are really willing to entertain more extreme views because it's, it's helping them raise more money and helping them stay in power, right? So that's the dangerous reality of our current dysfunctional duopoly. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Okay, guys, we're going to go into a break. Um, where can people view your website? How can they look, like during the break? Maybe they want to check it out and see what you're all about. Sure. Thanks. So it's uh, in Missouri. It's showmeintegrity.org. So that's all one word. Showmeintegrity.org. Okay, guys, we'll be back after this. Come back, and I'm speaking with Eric Bronner. And his organization is showmeintegrity.org. And and uh, before the break, we were just talking about what is wrong with some of the election, uh, some of the some of the tactics used for uh, electoral processes. And maybe one of the things that we can do is talk about what you did last year, which will cover that to some extent. Sure. It's, yeah. Great. Did you did you want me to talk about it now? Um, sure, because I know that safety of election is something that is of grave concern and something that your organization focused on. Sure, absolutely. So yeah, we had a couple of initiatives last year because of the pandemic. One was just to, uh, it was called MoVote.org to help uh, Missourians safely and securely request and receive their absentee ballots. Um, And then another, our our biggest campaign last year was called Proposition D for Better Democracy in St. Louis City. And it was a new voting system for the city of St. Louis that won with 68% support. Um, And I can go into the details. They they can get a little dry, but if you want to hear more, I'd be happy to tell you. Sure, please do. All right. So it's, the new system is an open, nonpartisan primary election, which means all the candidates run on one ballot, regardless of party, or if they have no party at all, they're all on one ballot. And then we use an innovative voting method called approval voting, which simply means you can vote for as many candidates as you approve of in the primary election. So right now, uh, tomorrow is the mayor's race in St. Louis City, and it's the first race under the new system. So there's four people running for mayor and you could vote for one, two, three, or all four if you wanted to. And then the top two vote getters of all the votes cast will go on to a runoff in the general election. And so an innovation like this, what it does is it counteracts the vote splitting of the old system, right? Where when you can only pick one person, what what kept on happening in St. Louis City was there essentially is one was one party rule, right? Whoever won the Democratic primary would always win. And we had the last five mayors were elected in the primary with 37 percent or less support, mm-hmm. which means a very small percentage of St. Louisans were electing the mayor under the old system. Was that hard to pass? I mean, that's a brilliant, innovative way to um, to to uh, to vote and to uh, to come up with this new alternative was that difficult to get people on board it, with this? Um, you know, there was a big education piece, and there there was a really beautiful coalition that was put together by some citizens. Um, our executive director Ben Singer was very involved, um, and, and and a number of other influential community leaders from across the political spectrum and a very diverse group came together and said, this is gonna be, make our elections far more competitive. And so they built such a strong diverse coalition that we really didn't have serious opposition until just a, a couple weeks before the election last year. So they did a fantastic job running the campaign. Mm-hmm. And voting integrity, do you think the votes were stolen? I mean, what's your opinion on that? Because there's been small issues with uh, the voting and counting, I should say, the counting the votes uh, for a long time. There's always been some some sense. Right, right. Of, yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I try to distinguish between retail fraud and wholesale fraud. Uh, retail fraud has been happening in elections since the beginning of time, right? That's 
in I just heard this statistic today in all of the investigations down in Georgia, all of the audits that were done, they only found two absentee ballots uh, of dead people voting. Two examples there, you know, all of the all of the hyperbole and lies about this massive wholesale fraud is li literally nothing more than a bunch of lies. Um, was there some retail fraud, a couple instances of people voting fraudulently? Yes, that happens in every election. We need to figure out ways to prevent fraud. No one, no one wants fraud in elections. We also don't want political leaders attacking our election system and uh, issuing death threats against Republican election officials in Georgia had to, you know, where their family was receiving death threats simply because they were doing their job and telling the truth. And it, 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 it really is frustrating as someone who has studied this very closely that people that anyone would continue to perpetuate the lie that it was a fraudulent election or that the election was stolen is just complete and utter nonsense. Mm -hmm. And that all that all stems from social media and QAnon, this uh, entity called QAnon. And we just have to remember back to the propaganda companies, political campaigns also employ agencies to influence public perception of their clients. And that's nothing new, except this is QAnon was much more devious. And I don't right. know why people didn't call out um, or didn't see clearly because they're so emotionally charged, which is the best way to uh, to to basically control a person is when they're emotional. Um, sure, mind sure. control, you could say mind control in some sense. And um, sure. yeah, and you know, I'm not sure. I can't say that it was Trump that caused all of this, but I do know there was a, a person named Thomas uh, Schoenberger, and he somehow became involved with the entity of QAnon that was actually established prior to 2017. And I guess a lot of this, like the agency that they're finding out that was involved with all of this, I guess Ezra Cohen Watnick. Uh, mm -hmm. was aligned with Israel's intelligence and under the Trump, under Trump, he was the acting secretary of, De of defense. And then, you know, between Schoenberger and Ezra Cohen Watnick, they were able to create this, uh, oh, and the name of the company that was hired was Psycorp. And I, you know, I got a hold of some very interesting emails and pamphlets uh, around QAnon and this this tactic that this tactic of propaganda, and it was basically right, right. try to confuse everybody. Say anything that's real, you just say it's fake news, um, and you, you say that enough, you know, you don't you do question everything you hear, and by saying no, oh, that's fake news, that's fake news, that's fake news. Um, well, how are we supposed to discern? And I would say. Uh, you know, watch a little more mainstream news. Um, it's not this evil entity um, that people have made it out to be and that was perpetuated by some of Trump's co uh, content. And I'm not anti-Trump. There were things he did and things he believed that I think he, he and he was uh, anti-corruption, like within the agencies. Um, he, there's things he did that I appreciate. Um, right. But I felt like he, didn't really care about the people as much as he did about his own image. Right. Yeah, and, and to your point about these echo, these echo chambers, right, all it takes is one person saying something with authority or with enough followers on Facebook, and then someone else repeats it. And if it gets repeated often enough, then suddenly people take it as truth. And it it's just this echo chamber where, where false information is getting shared over and over and over again until people are finally like, well, this has to be true because I've seen it from 10 different people, but it, it's, it's just not. And the, really, for me, the scary thing is America really does still have enemies out there, right? We have, there are foreign powers who would like to see America remain as divided as we are right now, because the more dysfunctional we are, the the less power we have to um, exert our overall, you know, positive agenda on, on the world. And um, we, uh, we're spending so much time fighting each other and demonizing each other that we're really taking our, our eye off of too many uh, very important national and international issues. Yes. It's yes. It's not just a word in this vacuum of, of 
of disinformation, misinformation, and fighting each other. You're right. Just we're in this little vacuum, uh, completely oblivious to everything going on. Uh, I mean, it's right. changing now with the Biden administration, but you know, Trump has his plans, and people are still listening to him. And whether that's good or bad, um, you know, history will <laughs> will show. And um, well, you know, yeah. Go ahead. No, oh, sorry. And I, I tell people often, you know. When I say we're cross-partisan, I really try to build bridges between the right and the left. My uh, my in-laws are all from southeastern Missouri, which is home to Rush Limbaugh. Uh, in, in fact, I have a sister-in-law whose last name is Limbaugh. And, and so I, I try to see things from their perspective, which is, by and large, their interactions with the federal government have been pretty negative. Uh, yes, has there been an agenda by one party to... Um, say that you can't trust the government and, and the government should be smaller. There, there has been, but I guess my point is there are legitimate points on the right and the left that are worth discussing, but we don't really have conversations and then try to come up with some kind of solution. We just we just keep shouting at each other. And if you don't think like I do, then you're the enemy. I'm a patriot. You're a traitor. You know, it's, it just gets so it, ridiculous and, and our conversation devolves so quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just hope there's going to be some kind of change. And with all this emotional fervor, you can't talk to a person who is so emotional uh, about their opinions. As you know, like if anyone's been in an argument with their loved one, um, when someone's emo that's why they say when you're having an argument, you need to walk away and cool off. But there seems to be no right. cooling off of um, some of this uh you know, that some of these uh, problems that are occurring and some of these arguments that are occurring. And people just have to have an open mind. Listen without judgment. I say that all the time. And I do it myself. I practice what I preach. I listen right. without judgment, I, you know, and I, sometimes I'll insert a fact or uh, direct someone to a fact. I remember on my Facebook, there was a political discussion. And uh, two of the people uh, from Texas uh, hadn't weren't even watching the trial, and I'm like, well, you can't really have a discussion if you're not watching the trial and seeing the facts and some of the right. counter arguments. You really, really need to watch that. And one person did realize that her previous opinion um, maybe needed to be modified a little bit. And it is about trying to come together somewhere in the middle. We can agree, but like you said, you, you've made a statement that you know the middle is not necessarily the answer, but um, if we can take out the extremism. Extremism has never worked historically. Right. Right. And and the center of our political spectrum has atrophied to such an extent that we don't have anyone to broker these conversations anymore in in Congress. I mean, there, you know, there's four or five, quote unquote, moderates, but we, we really do need more moderate politicians to get elected so that they can broker conversations between because not all radical ideas are bad, right? Uh, yesterday's radical idea can be tomorrow's, you know, great innovation that, that we need to move our country forward. But um, right now, we just don't have anyone brokering real solutions in the center of the spectrum. I will mention, um, Ella, one, I, I tell people there's a number of things that give me a lot of hope doing this work. One is that the, the next generation is far less partisan than my generation. I do hope that technology will lead to some solutions to safe and secure voting methods where more people can participate in our elections safely and securely. Um, and then the last thing is there are literally hundreds of cross-partisan or nonpartisan political reform organizations. There's great, I don't, you know, I can list off a ton, but one is the Common Ground Committee. Uh, they try to bring light, not heat, to public discourse. There is uh, Issue One and the Institute for Political Innovation and Represent Us and Fair Vote and OpenPrimaries.org. They're all working to fix the system itself so that when we elect better people, we will get better results. Mm -hmm. Well put. Well put. Okay, well, we just have like uh, 15 more minutes. So what's, what are your plans and what's the future of your organization looking like? Yeah, thank you for asking. So um, I just mentioned the Institute for Political Innovation is based out of Chicago. It was started by this fascinating Wisconsin businesswoman named Catherine Gale. 
And she and Harvard Business School professor Michael Porter wrote what I think is the most important political book of 2020. It's just called The Politics Industry. The book is fantastic because it's an even-handed equal opportunity offender for both you know, people on the right and the left. And not only does it correctly diagnose our problems, but she offers some very clear solutions in the form of reforms that her organization is working to implement and pass right now. So I don't know if you're familiar with the, the voting reform that the state of Alaska just passed in November. No, I'm not. But, so that's an example of what Catherine Gale and the Institute for Political Innovation support. So it was, uh, Alaska just passed in November an open nonpartisan primary for all federal elections. That means, again, that everyone runs on one ballot. And then the top four will go to the general election where you use ranked choice voting, which is sometimes called instant runoff, to rank those candidates one to four. And that will automatically give you a winner. And again, this type of reform, it, it incentivizes collaborative campaigning. It takes power away from the partisan machines, and it will incentivize better, better results, more competitive elections. So um, that was passed in Alaska, and Catherine Gale and her Institute for Political Innovation is working on getting a similar system passed in Wisconsin right now. Mm -hmm. And so the organization that I'm building, uh, Veterans for Political Innovation, we will, uh, we will inspire veterans to actively advocate and mobilize for these kinds of campaigns in states all over the country. Mm -hmm. And this is going kind of going off the road here a little bit, but what about the educational systems? I mean, I really believe that through school, through schooling, that, that we can maybe teach children how to have more of an open mind. But you you also stated that there's going to be less uh, partisan um, dissension. You, that's your personal belief. I mean, I think that school can play a huge part in this, as well as, of course, you know, kids are influenced by their family members and their parents. Sure. And, and there, there's a, a robust conversation going on right now about the need for more civics education, right, uh, in light of what happened on January 6th, especially. And, and we definitely do need a stronger civics curriculum. From what I understand, it varies greatly from state by state, right? Some states have a robust curriculum, others, it, civics education is almost non existent. So mm -hmm. we do need to have a, a stronger baseline of civics education for sure. Um, but again, I, I think for me, the way that we uh, uh, get people more excited about participating in our democratic republic is by showing them that we have a system that is truly responsive and truly representative of what the public desires. And right now we don't have that, that system in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about the school system, it just seems to be so broken. We don't even like pledge allegiance anymore. I, I'm kind of shocked by that. How can we feel so, unified if we're not showing that we're, we're, we are one nation under God and that we all are Americans, no matter what our beliefs are. Right. I, well, I was going to say that must be different from state to state. I know my, my kids here in our school system definitely still say the, the Pledge of Allegiance at the start of every day. Um, so I, I bet that's a, you know, a state by state thing that is different. Decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, education is extremely important and my, that's part of my passion. I'm the, I'm the son of two public school educators. My mom was an immigrant from Germany, and she taught German in Milwaukee. My dad was an inner city reading teacher. So I, I, one of my passions is to educate people about the, the idea that we do not have to keep doing democracy the way that we're doing it. There is nowhere in the Constitution does it mention the word political party at all, right? And, and yet these two private political parties dominate how the rules get written and again part of the reason i'm so passionate about this i'm an independent right and someday i hope to run for office as an independent and in most states uh right now really across the country i don't have a chance unless i join one of the two private political parties and i just to me there's something fundamentally wrong ab about that mm -hmm. agreed and so and sometimes when you run as an independent you're just basically lost you're almost doomed to fail you're just, just 
Yeah. Right. And they say, well, don't vote for Eric. You're just throwing your vote away and you're going to help candidate X get elected instead. And that's why we need those voting innovations such as approval voting or ranked choice voting. Right. Because then there's no longer any spoiler effect um, when you get to rank your candidates or approve of multiple candidates. So there's these innovations that are re readily available. We just need to find the, the will to, to implement them in states across the country. Mm -hmm. And we have such a large country with so many diverse beliefs uh, that's right. another problem yeah well and it can be a strength too that uh, you know i really respect david french he, he's a great uh writer um he's a conservative uh, he's an evangelical christian but he he walked away from the republican party uh when when trump was nominated and he his critique in in divided we fall which the the subtitle is america's secession threat and how to restore our nation his his idea is that we kind of have to go back to you know james madison talked about the danger of the violence of faction but that the solution to that is really more pluralism which is means you empower people with different ideas to go start their own clubs and their own civic organizations and if different states want to do things differently that's okay it's when we try to enforce our views on one another in a national kind of heavy handed way that is actually putting more and more pressure on us and, and causing us to, to rip apart at the seams. Mm -hmm. You've made some so, excellent points. Mm -hmm. so, so what are you guys working on at the moment, your organization? I mean, we went into a little bit about it, what the plans are. Um, what do you, is there anything else that you're working on currently? We are, um, so Show Me Integrity is very active in Missouri. So building off of our win in St. Louis City, we're trying to do a similar uh, campaign in St. Louis County, which is Missouri's largest county. We're also trying to implement the Honest Elections Act, which is a small donor opt-in campaign finance system. So to get around the Citizens United opinion, it's an opt-in system where candidates, if they choose to opt into this system they agree to abide by a long list of rules disclose mandatory disclosure not taking any uh, PAC money or contributions over $250 and if they agree to all those things then they receive a public match or um, can receive what uh, Seattle has is they're called democracy vouchers where registered voters get to give these vouchers to candidates and then the candidates turn those in and, and those turn into small donations to their campaign Mm -hmm. So the innovative campaign systems, we're trying to get independent redistricting in uh, St. Louis City. You know, there's a real big push for that nationally for independent redistricting. It's it should be criminal that our politicians get to draw their own maps and get to pick their own voters. Um, and the fact that we continue to allow that is just it's it's one of the underlying causes of our polarization and and how uncompetitive our system is nationwide, right? Is all this the gerrymandering, which is also called redistricting. Mm -hmm. You should be a senator. I'm th I, I, I see a future <laughs> uh, of you uh, being a senator in your state. Oh, well, thank thank you a lot. I I would be open to that someday. I have a lot of work to do, uh, you know, to reform the system first if I want to run as an independent and have any chance at at winning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I understand that. And let's see, we still got a couple more minutes. I just want to say thank you to this amazing station, uh, Truth Frequency Radio. I just appreciate it uh, so very much where we can come on and uh, us as hosts and talk about whatever it is that we that's important to us and, and give a platform to people like yourself that have valuable information to share. And I hope people listening um, got something out of to, out of today and uh, maybe didn't have such an emotional reaction, maybe took a more open-minded approach in listening. And, you know, I don't think opinions should be set in stone. I think they should right, be modified. Right. And the way they're modified is by listening without all the emotion. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. More empathetic listening. We, and, offering each other a lot more grace too, right? I mean, everyone's going to make mistakes or, or say something stupid from time to time. Um, but we just, I don't know, we're so quick to really demonize people. And um, we need to remember we're all humans. We are all children of one ever-loving God, as, as my uh, grandpa would say. And for that reason, 
we have to figure out ways to get to get along and work together better, even when we disagree or have different ideas about the best course of action. Mm -hmm. And there's that thing called compromise. It works in life very well. Um, but of right. course, to take all this financial interest and all these deep pockets and the lobbyists um, uh, need right. to be addressed also, because I feel like the lobbyists really control so much of, uh, of the policy making. Yes, yes, it's really unfortunate. I mean, I think the you know you've made may have heard the statistic, but in the 2016 election cycle, about 16 billion dollars was spent on federal elections through the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. 16 billion dollars, and I ask I often ask people, what what do we the people get for that money? What do we mm -hmm. what do we really get from that? Yeah, my you should see. I just something in me like clamps up. It's like that money could be used for so much good, so much sure. good. Instead, it's just a, like, a, you know, a commercial for right. just money thrown into through things that just like we said, could be better used. And, it, and we shouldn't commercial, commercialize uh, politicians. And, um, you know, we're again, we're one nation and we should remember that. And we do have a common goal, and that is to unify um, and find compromise the best that we can. And I'm looking forward to see how the political landscape changes over the next couple of years. And just remember, we can have different views in different political in uh, political views, especially, and still still care about each other. Still remember, yeah, we're, yeah. I'm a human, you're a human. We all want a better world. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you just need to, uh, you know, you have to uh, reshape your opinions and find comp compromise within yourself because we have a damn fine nation. I yeah, love yeah. this nation. My parents were immigrants and they love this nation. And I, that's what we just have to remember that we are not just a single person with opinions. We're an entire group of people. And for that matter, on a global level too. But of course, this is our home and this is where we need to stand together.